Just as my other one. I'll probably recognize you right away, but <laughs> actually, I'm a little slow to recognize. Okay, yeah. Uh, this is the mayor of the planning board. Uh, this is our meeting for Tuesday, our regular meeting for Tuesday, November 25th. Um, I'm going to start by introducing the board. On the far left is Peter Brothers. Good evening, everyone. Next to him is Liz Lapham. And we have Roger Sorrell, the vice chairman. And on my right next to me, I have Ann Butler. Richard Gerken, Ed Tui, and then the town, town planner, um, Angela Lebrecht, and then Mary Lee Harvey, the town clerk, and I'm Bill Byard, I'm the chairman. Uh, let's see, we have a view and approval of minutes of November 25th, 2014. Has anybody got any Mr. Issues? Chairman, yes. may I amend that the approval of minutes should be for November 10th, which is our last meeting. October 28th was canceled due to lack of a quorum. That's true, yeah. Okay. yeah. So that would be I, approving today's minutes, wouldn't it? If it was would, it would be, sir. So I, I, I move that we approve the minutes of uh, November 10th. Okay. That's a good idea. Thank you. Second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. So. Uh, next, we have application submissions. This is the submission portion. Hearings may be done later on. Um, uh, first, we have Mary Hefferton and Hubbard Beach Association proposed boundary line adjustment between Mary Hefferton and Hubbard Beach Association to correct a portion of the Hefferton driveway where it goes over the property line. Tax map U28 lot A 25A and U29 lot 30 located at Stoneham Island Road in the Shoreline District. Angela, do you have anything on that? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is a boundary line adjustment um, because a portion of the driveway encroaches onto the Hubbard Beach Association land um, that accesses the Heffron um, single-family dwelling. The boundary line adjustment plan, application checklist, and abutters list are on file. The application fee has been paid. There's been a waiver request for environmental information, such as soils, topography, and wetlands. Um, the request is requested due to the limited scope of work. It's just a boundary line adjustment, and both properties are already developed. It's recommended the waiver be granted and that the application be accepted as complete. For a public hearing this evening. By accepting the application, the board is granting the waiver. Okay, so do I have a motion to accept the application and grant the waiver or any discussion on this? So moved. A motion and do I have a second? Second. A motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 And opposed? Next, we go to Wayne Alquist, Jr., proposed site plan amendment for a change of use within the existing approved building, buildings, tax map S19, lot 4, located at 55 Daniel Webster Highway in the commercial Route 3 South District. Angela, do you have Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a previously approved site plan by the Planning Board. They'd like to change the use in one of their buildings to accommodate a um, martial arts class. The application's on file, the fee's been paid, and it's recommended that the application for site plan amendment be accepted as complete for a public hearing this evening. Okay. Do we have any questions or a motion? So moved. Okay. Second. I have a motion for approval, I assume, and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, next, we move to the public hearings portion. Um, I'm going to move the CIP to a little bit later. Um, we'll start with uh, Richard Seeley, proposed subdivision and site plan for a condominium conversion of two houses to residential con condos, tax map U30. U23, lots 15 and 
36 located at 12 Oak Island Road in the Shoreline District. Application was accepted August 26, 2014. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, Dave Dolan for the applicants. Uh, Richard Seeley and Crystal St. Cyr Seeley. Uh, Mr. Seeley is here tonight as well as his attorney, Rod Dyer. It's an application for a condominium conversion of properties uh, located out on Oak Island. I'm sorry, Oak Island Road. It's in the Spindle Point subdivision. Um, there's two properties involved. There's a lakefront property. It's tax map U23, lot 15. It has about 200 feet of frontage on the lake. And then the back lot, which is tax map U23, lot 36, which is pretty much vacant. And it's about 50,000 square feet in area. Um, the lakefront lot has been developed to get in, in the late 40s at the time of the subdivision. And it consists of several small parcels of land that were pieced together by the previous owner. Um, there's two existing dwellings on the property. There's a dwelling right here, which is labeled as New Day, and it's referred to as been called the Blue Building. There's a brown building here, uh, which is the other dwelling. There's also a shed, a bunkhouse, a boathouse that's half boathouse and half finished area, um, and a garage on the back lot. There's a gravel driveway and a storage area that was installed last summer. The driveway permit was issued for that, and that's noted on the plans that have been submitted. There's pretty extensive wetland across the property. Um, there's two small areas of wetland that are less than 3,000 square feet, so they'd be non-designated exempt wetlands. You can see Oak Island Road splits the properties, and it doesn't exactly follow the original <coughs> layout of the road for the subdivision, and we've noted that on the plan. Um, again, the proposal is for what we're asking for a site plan and subdivision approval to convert the property, the form of ownership, to condominium, form of ownership known as Crystal Vista or condominium. Um, so what we've shown on the plan is a limited common area A, which contains unit A, an existing two-bedroom house. That has about 65 feet of frontage directly on the lake associated with that limited common area. What was a dock, one of the docks, um, and the garage will be part of Unit A. And the, what's shown as Unit B, or what we called the brown house earlier, is contained within limited common area B, which is right here. It's about 23,000 square feet, and it has that dwelling, as well as the shed, the bunk house, and the boat house. Um, there will be some minor changes to the names as they're designated on the plans that were submitted, which is part of some of the agreement that was worked out with the association between the applicant and the Spindle Point Association. Um, specifically, instead of calling this the bunkhouse, I believe it will now be the guest house and it will be designated as part of limited common area B. And the boat is shown on this plan and the plans that were submitted is boathouse, bunkhouse, it will say boathouse, part of limited common area B. Um, the back portion of the lot here is all common area. And then across the road, the majority of the back lot is shown as it's part of limited common area B. A portion of the back lot, which is subject to the uh, use of Oak Island Road as well as the ditches and drainage associated with that, that's all designated as common area. As I said earlier, both of the existing dwellings are two, two bedrooms presently. Um, they'll be proposed and shown in the plan as possible future four bedrooms in each. There will be two separate septic systems designed. One would be for the future use of unit A. Um, there is an existing septic system for that building now, which was built around 1980 at the time of that building. The other buildings right now have um, their own, if the house has a septic system behind it, the bunk house has a small sewage so disposal area, uh, whether it's a dry well, dry well, a cesspool of some kind. In this area and the boathouse, again, has its own small dry well behind it between the boathouse and the boathouse. Uh, there'll be a separate septic system designed for 
units B for up to a total of six bedrooms, um, four up to four in the brown house or unit B, and two in the guest house. And those locations for the future septic systems are shown on the plan right here and here. There's two existing wells that will continue to serve separately, um, unit A and unit B. When a septic system gets installed for unit B in the future, a well will have to be relocated in order to comply with setback distances, protective well radius. Uh, we've shown it earlier off the corner of unit B, but that's going to have to be placed back in this area, and that revision will be shown on final plans. Uh, we will be subject to state subdivision approval, as well as the septic design approvals. Uh, we've shown well, the existing driveway that comes in and services the property. Presently, and in the past, the parking and storage has been undefined and just among the trees. We've shown possible parking for potential of up to 10 spaces to demonstrate that the lot could support the proposed uses, um, including two bed, uh, parking spaces in the garage. There's no intent to actually construct or pave those, it's just to demonstrate to the board and for purposes of approval that the site would accommodate those spaces in those locations. Uh, we've shown the parking calculations, parking summary on the plan, the final lot coverage, which is under 10% for the lakefront lot and it's 13% for the back lot. Um, again, it's simply just a change in the form of ownership is what we're requesting for approval from the board. Um, there's been some, again, negotiations between the applicant and the Spindle Point Association due to the fact that there's some covenants and restrictions associated with all the Spindle Point properties. And uh, if the board has any questions regarding the plan, I'll attempt to answer those. Um, if not, Mr. Dyer can address the condominium conversion and some of the other issues <coughs> that we are on with the project. Mr. Chairman, I yeah, just had one question on the map itself. When you look on page two, um, just quickly, I find that the title limited common area B is is a little a little um, a little confusing because you you have a unit A and you unit B, and yet it's really common property. So my question is, can it be can it be changed or or or, or just listed as common area? No, but it is limited. It is limited common area. It, yes. To unit B only. Oh, to, it is to B only. Yes. And Whereas the other same. one is is common for both. Back here is common for both. So that is the intent. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you for the clarification. No Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, my name is Rod Dyer. I live in Guilford. Uh, I'm a member of the Westgate Law Firm in, in Laconia. And um, I've uh, prepared the, the condominium declaration. And I've been uh, representing Rich and his uh, wife, Crystal, with regard to this matter. As Dave indicated, what we're seeking is simply a conversion of the form of ownership as far as the property is concerned. I know you've uh, had uh, condominium conversions come uh, before you on other occasions, so I, I won't go into any details other than the fact that I, I'm sure you understand that in any condominium in the state of New Hampshire is regulated by state law. You can't have a condominium unless you comply with the provisions of the uh, Condominium Act. Um, as Dave also indicated, uh, and I'd like to emphasize, we're not here seeking any change, any physical change in the property. What we're seeking is uh, conversion of the ownership of the property as it, it, it exists today. In other words, we're not seeking, uh, we're not asking you to approve of any future changes as far as the project is concerned, but just simply to acknowledge um, as part of the process that uh, this property uh, henceforth would, <coughs> would, with your approval, become a uh, condominium uh, form of ownership as far as the property is concerned. Um, there are, as Dave has indicated, there are two primary structures which presently exist on the property. 
and there are uh, what we consider two guest houses, uh, both of which would conform to your, as I understand it, uh, your existing zoning uh, uh, provisions as far as guest houses are concerned. Um, we have uh, submitted the as -built plans. I've also submitted a copy of the a declaration to, of condominium to your uh, planner uh, some, uh, some months ago. Uh, we've also been working for a number of months with the uh, Spindle Point uh, Civic Association to uh, come to an accommodation with, with them and to assure them that uh, there will not be any uh, specific changes as far as the use uh, of the property is concerned and that uh, any, any future use will be in accordance with the memorandum of understanding that's been signed by Rich and Crystal Seely with the association. A copy of that uh, written document has been submitted to your planner, but I'd like to just briefly highlight uh, some of the provisions that uh, are in, in there. And I have extra copies if uh, any of the members of, of the board would like to see them. Would you? concept that's been around for a, for a number of years. But just briefly, uh, the memorandum of understanding that has been uh, arrived at between the association and, and Richard Crystal is the document that is in front of you. And I'll just uh, hit some of the highlights. Number one, the owners agree that their entire property, uh, located at 12 Oak Island in Meredith, shall not at any time have more than two dwelling units on the premises. So there, that is an, uh, a restriction stating that uh, henceforth uh, there will never be more than the two existing residential structures on the property. Um, number two, there shall be no more than two guest houses within the waterfront property and no guest house shall be permitted on the back lot. In other words, one guest house per residential unit. Uh, there is a utility shed and excellent, and also there's a restriction that there be no more than five buildings on the waterfront property. Paragraph three states that uh, neither guest house shall have kitchen facilities and neither guest house may be rented separately and should be available only for guests of the dwelling unit to which the guest house appertains. Paragraph four, uh, no dwelling or guest house shall be constructed on the back lot and only a, a garage or other accessory non-residential structure may be constructed on the back lot. However, as you well know, any future construction such as a garage would require uh, an application to the town and perhaps uh, site plan approval as far as the planning board is concerned. So, that's simply uh, an understanding between the Sealies and the uh, association that if anything in the future is requested, that it will not include a dwelling and will be limited to, to a non-residential structure such as a garage. Uh, paragraph 5, the septic system shall be designed for no more than two dwellings with the guest house attaching to uh, each unit, and the septic system shall be designed and constructed to accommodate no more than 12 bedrooms. Once again, if there were an expansion of the existing property, uh, applications would have to be filed with the town 
and uh, we are not asking for any approval by this board uh, for anything other than what is on the face of the earth, what is actually there uh, on this day. Number six, uh, the cabin guest house shown on the plan shall be a guest house for the, the larger unit uh, B, and the uh, pertinent boathouse shall not be a guest house. The garage depicted on the plan shall be uh, pertinent to limited common A. That's the garage that's in front of uh, uh, unit A right here. Um, Seven, there will be no signage identifying the property as a condominium. And eight, uh, these provisions shall be included in the declaration of condominium submitted to the Meredith Planning Board in conjunction with the conversion of the property to a condominium form of ownership. And nine, the provisions set forth in this memorandum cannot be amended without the written approval of the Spindle Point Civic Association. So the bottom line is that uh, we have spent several months uh, working with the association, and I believe that they would uh, so indicate that we've uh, uh, acquiesced to their concerns, uh, have, have addressed their concerns, and have committed to uh, uh, make sure that their concerns are uh, codified and put in writing and are enforceable. So every uh, provision that I uh, just uh, read with regard to the Memorandum of Understanding is also included in Article 18 of the Declaration of Condominium. So, uh, and it, these are verbatim copies, so whatever I read uh, is, is incorporated into the uh, Declaration and a copy of which has been uh, submitted to your, your plan. Um, so I think in summary, uh, we've submitted the required information, the, the as-built plans prepared by Dave Dolan, uh, the Declaration of Condominium, uh, the written uh, uh, accommodation with the Spindle Point uh, folks, um, and I, I think under those circumstances uh, uh, I would be warranted in asking that uh, your review include a, uh, hopefully an approval this evening so we can proceed to implement the, the condominium, record the declaration, and uh, continue to work with the association. So, thank you very much, and uh, if there are any questions based on my comments, I'll be happy to answer them, if possible. Yeah, are there any questions, uh, initial questions from the board? Mr. Chairman, I'm a little confused. On the plan, it shows two septic systems. That's correct. And the condominium documents state there will only be one septic system? No. Um, to accommodate 12 bedrooms? Uh, no, there will be, there'll be um, when it says the septic system, it probably should, should have said the septic systems, because there will be multiple systems, one for each uh, of the primary dwellings. And uh, these and are standby and systems that require... Uh, that, that I have five. It refers to one septic system for up to 12 bedrooms, but the plan shows two separate septic okay. systems. That's correct. And what, what the accommodation should have said is that the septic systems, and we'll, we'll amend that. So that we're, David, correct? In the, in, the condominium, in the condominium declarations underneath water and sewage system, it does say each unit shall have its individual sewage disposal system. That's so it does talk about each unit having its own <coughs> sewer disposal system. I guess making that provision plural would just be consistent with right. And the guest house the plan. and right. cabins won't have bathrooms? Pardon me? Guest house and cabins won't? They won't have, they will not have kitchens. They, they have bathrooms. They, they, they may have plumbing already. Ba bathrooms. And it'll go into the their existing. Systems. But they will not have kitchens. Okay. At which time they're required to be in no. Yes, Liz. I'm having, just to show me where the, the guest house for the unit A is. I, I can't see anything that says. It's, it's a proposed, actually, it's the, two, the, the garage uh, showing two uh, parking spaces. In theory. Oh, you're going to convert that we, to a guest we house? Add, uh, maybe another floor, yeah. and that would be the guest house. But oh. once again, that's not part of the approval that we're asking you for tonight. 
if if the uh, if that were to happen, then Rich would file the necessary applications with the town in the future. But in order to uh, reach an accommodation with the association, so that we have a firm understanding as to what uh, can happen to the property now and in the future, uh, that that provision is in there. Okay, and the unit. The guest house is the bunkhouse. It, it, the unit B is the um, yeah. It's now termed the bunkhouse, but as Dave indicated, that's going to be changed on the plan. And I believe he saw he's already mentioned that to the plan. And so the, that will be the guest house. Okay. And the boat house will not be a guest house. That's correct. It'll be a boat house. Where, if the, it's a 12 bedroom septic and each house is, is proposed four bedrooms, are you, it does, it, does that indicate that each guest house will have two bedrooms? Or there'll be a bedroom in the boat house? Yeah, no, no, conceivably, uh, what could happen, and once again, uh, this is projected into the future, uh, and it's not really uh, uh, anything that we're seeking your approval for, but uh, theoretically, then Unit B could have a total of four bedrooms, Unit A could have a total of four bedrooms, and each of the uh, guest houses could have a total of two bedrooms. And that would be the total uh, maximum of 12, 12 bedrooms on the property. Mr. Chairman? Yes. So if I may, um, the, greater, the greater portion of these covenants are just with our, our private covenants the planning board um, doesn't enforce. There's there's private covenants all over town um, that the planning board, or that the town does not enforce. Like, um, you can't have a dog more than 50 pounds. You know, that sort of thing is, is everywhere. There, we have so many associations. Um, what we typically look for in, in the, in the um, condo docs is language that um, basically makes the plan consistent with our, I guess, ordinances or, or regulations that the use is um, restricted to, like, say, single-family dwelling. I make sure that, um, you know, it talks about who owns what and who maintains what. For instance, like, you maintain your own septic system or we share the cost of maintaining the driveway or if it's a private road, for instance, um, with something this small, there's there's very little um, that I really need to look for in the, in the documents because um, it's it's two houses. It's not like a, a whole neighborhood with you know a lot of things that are shared, common. For instance, like road and drainage systems and things like that. So um, I basically I, I look for you know something that talks about the septics, the wells um, that. The plan is noted in there with the correct date, the correct revision date, that there's recording information that would tie back to the plan in the declarations. All these other concessions that have been made by the applicant, um, those are basically private things that the town wouldn't really um, get involved in. Again, the use of single family dwelling. So whether you have three, four, or five bedrooms, it wouldn't, that's consistent with, I mean, you can have a five bedroom house at your, at, where you live, or you can have a two-bedroom house, it doesn't go against any any ordinance, regardless of the form of ownership being condominium or just owned, like you all own your houses regularly. Do you, do you, follow, do you follow me? Okay. I, I just want to... So a lot of what, what we just reviewed is are, are really private things between the homeowners, an agreement between the homeowner association and the applicant, um, the majority of which the town isn't really get involved. It's just, I think we're just being made aware of, of what the agreements have been between the two parties. Uh, just a, a comment there. They're proposing to incorporate it within the condominium documents, sure. which is understandable because they want it to be part of what the condominium is in association with the, or regards to the association. That does not in any way uh, bind us to uh, enforce any of these provisions. No, they could say you can't paint your house blue. I mean, we, we, right. can't, we don't enforce no, that sort of thing. No, I understand that, but so, yeah, right. we just want to make sure that it's 
distinguish that these are right. There's certain provisions that we would like if all of a sudden, um, you know, your condo document could say you're allowed to have a, a manufacturing plant, on, but just because a condominium document says it doesn't mean we would allow it. And so sure. that's what I review it for to make sure it's not there's any there's no inconsistencies with our regulations or our zoning. I'd just like to make one other point that I neglected to make. As a condominium, I, I just remind you that uh, under the condominium form, family dwelling, that's consistent with the uses permitted in the Shoreline District. The setbacks are noted on the plan. There is a pre existing non conforming um, encroachment on, by Unit A into the front setback. It's um, just a, a portion of, of the dwelling, though. And um, it would have to comply with expanding non-conforming the provision in the zoning ordinance with respect to expanding non-conforming structures um, at the time that they go to do another two bedrooms, should they ever have another two more bedrooms. Um, the lot coverage committed by the district is 30%, and there is 9.64% um, lot coverage on lot 15 and 3.2% on lot 36. So that, there's two lots, one on each side of the road. Wetlands have been delineated by wetland scientists, and they are shown on the plan and their buffers. Um, I make a recommendation that the approved, that the septic system has been approved by DES, the approval number just be noted on the plan. Um, I also do make a note about the um, septic systems to be approved by DES. The design approvals should incorporate um, two additional bedrooms for the what what's labeled as the bunkhouse. I realize these titles would be changed, but what's labeled as a bunkhouse and what's labeled as a boathouse. Um, private wells are shown, as Dave mentioned. If one well is not in an acceptable location according to where the new septic system is going to go, then it would have to be moved outside that 75 foot radius. Or it'd have to be moved so that the 75 foot radius doesn't encroach onto the proposed septic area. Um, utilities are on site. Access and parking will remain the same. It's demonstrated on the plan that there's sufficient amount of area to park. And um, I recommend the conditional approval is valid for a period of only 24 months until the approval expires. If the approval is not executed, Any which it sounds like they're eager to do so. I don't think there'll be a problem. Any questions? Further questions from the board? <coughs> um, and so I just had something I wanted to question about. Um, you mentioned that there could be, you know, there's limited expansion uh, potential for the Unit A um, because there's some encroachment. Also note that uh, Bunkhouse B and of course the Boathouse, you know, Boathouse is uh, within that. It, do we have any restrictions on how that, how those work? You can't expand anything to make it more non-conforming. So we, we, the ordinance does allow for a small natural expansion of a, of a structure, of a non-conforming structure. Um, certainly not enough for two bedrooms. Um, so as long as the expansion occur, did not make it more non-conforming, like going close to the, closer to the water versus expanding off the back towards, towards the road, um, then it would meet the, the zoning. And that would be done um, by amending the plan and through a building permit. So it would be reviewed twice to ensure you're not um, creating or compounding a non-conformity. And that, that's, a, that's a review that basically gets done every single day with, with applications that get submitted to our office. Okay. Any, any additional questions from the board? If not, I'll open it up to the public for any comments from the public. Um, we need you to come up and give your name. What town do you live in? Uh, 
I'm uh, Robert Emery. Uh, we are currently living at 37 Oak Island Road on Oak Island. And uh, I'm concerned about the extra personal density that's going to be created by this if we have as many bedrooms as stated. I do the math and I see a possibility of uh, 24 people that's on children. this property. And it, well, they may be children. Well, and if children are involved and there are more than two beds in a bedroom, then uh, the density becomes larger. I'm only concerned about uh, setting a precedent, too, down this area. We've been involved in uh, Spindle Point for 42 years, myself and uh, my wife longer. And uh, we've seen many changes, uh, including the starting to blossom the number of garages on the inside of the road. Uh, it's uh, taking away some of the, the woodsy aspect of this area. And uh, I, for one, am a proponent of uh, the Loon Association. And we've been trying to get loons to, uh, to nest on our back beach and they have made quite a few attempts. We now have a raft uh, for loon nesting that was out this season, but was put out a little bit late as far as their usage. Uh, I'm concerned about increased boating in the back cove area that uh, this uh, waterfront is on. The depth of the water there in front of that property is uh, minimal, and uh, the increased activity in the whole back from a lot of weekend activity uh, with people coming up and setting fireworks off and uh, that sort of thing. I mean, again, it's uh, becoming uh, a little bit more, in my opinion, like uh, the Weir's Beach area than uh, Spindle Point. So that uh, my wife and I are concerned about uh, slowly uh, the whole area growing to a much denser uh, population than uh, maybe is appropriate for this space. That's the way we feel. Thank you. Any additional comments? Oh, yeah, sure, come on. I appreciated what you said about the town. I'm Paula Halpern, 33 Oak Island Road. And I appreciated what you said about the town's um, involvement and responsibilities versus the Spindle Points Association. Uh, but I would assume this might be a town responsibility. I'm concerned if you're talking about 12 bedrooms, you're talking about a minimum of 12 cars perhaps. And that is a very relatively narrow road. I'm concerned about uh, egress and people going in and out of that road and making the turn. Um, and I'm concerned, that, I'm assuming these are going to be renters uh, to some degree or subletters. And I know from past experience they really do not always respect the property. And as um, uh, Mr. Emery was saying also, they don't respect the cove and uh, there's a lot of activity. It's a very small cove. You get more than a couple of, uh, you know, there are uh, all sorts of boats there and uh, jet skis and you have a few more jet skis and you're really jeopardizing the safety of people in that area who have purposely picked that area for its tranquility. And uh, as I said, with the traffic pattern, I think that should be really uh, a consideration of the town as well. Additional comments or concerns to be raised by the public? Can I ask a question? Um, if you come up here. I am 
I'm Elizabeth Rodeberg. I live at Three Lighthouse Point on, on Spindle Point. And I just had a question because I'm kind of new to this and I don't understand. Like, what is the difference between a single family dwelling and a condominium dwelling? What, how does that, how does the zoning change? What is the difference? Can somebody answer that? I'd be happy to. If I may, Mr. Chairman, there's, there's absolutely no difference. Excuse me, if you can answer that. There's, there's uh, really no difference. It's uh, that's uh, a condominium unit can be any any type of dwelling, and uh, it's it's simply a form of ownership. So it has nothing to do with the physical characteristics of the, of the residence. So uh, it, hopefully, it, uh, if the board approves of the conversion, nothing physical is going to happen. Um, the the only thing that will happen will be that it will the form of ownership will change. But the units will be exactly the same. The, the two dwellings will be exactly the same. Um, as far as any future uses or expansions are concerned, that's for another day, not for the, the board tonight, because all we're asking uh, them to do is to approve of the uh, condominium conversion based on what's on the, uh, on the ground at this time. And that's uh, the, the dwellings with a number of bedrooms that are there at the present time. Okay. Well, I guess I'm, I'm curious as to what the, the conversion is and how that impacts the rest of the zoning on Spindle Point. I mean, does this open a can of worms for the rest of the residents to convert to condominiums? Not, nece not necessarily. I, you know, it depends on the circumstances. Um, any person that uh, has uh, property uh, under certain, certain circumstances could uh, convert it to a condominium uh, if they meet the criteria as far as the, the state uh, statute is concerned. And, they, and anyone who wishes to convert to a condominium has to um, uh, approach the local planning board and obtain approval. And that's the check and balance that's, that's involved. That answers your question. Uh, I'd also point out that um, uh, as far as the, the renting is concerned, there is a specific uh, prohibition of, uh, about any of the guest houses being rented or used. They're only uh, uh, literally guest houses to be used in conjunction with the, the uh, unit, uh, units A and B. And so they're basically family guest houses. So is it going to change from one owner to multiple owners? Two. Two. To two. So it will increase the density. In other words, it, it's, it's no different from two, two people owning the property. In other words, uh, the property could be held in the, in, in the form of a trust. It could be held uh, as joint tenants with rights of survivorship. It could be held as tenants in common so that uh, uh, the form of ownership really doesn't uh, uh, affect, in any measurable way, the use of the property. So if I may, use, when you say use, that's, that's typically zoning. So the use is single family residential. Right. And, that, and, that's, and that's zoning. Condominium is a form of ownership. Okay. Right. So it would still be single family. Correct. That's what I was curious about. Thank but, you. Well, thank you. But now it'll be two families instead of one right, on that property. Well, it could be two families in any event. Two families could buy that property and then just informally share, share the ownership of it. So well, it really is a, it isn't a major issue. Density, <clears throat> density is not dictated by how many people own the property. It's the amount of um, units per land area. So this is a, has a given land area, this lot, this property does, and there's two residential units on there. And that's the density. Yeah, um, if you would, maybe we discuss just briefly about condominiums. Um, I don't consider myself an expert on it, but basically what we're looking for, if I'm not mistaken, is um, we're, we review the condominium documents in terms of ownership, it's this is not a um, 
use per se. This is not set up where we go through a site plan evaluation and stuff like that. It's basically the condominium uh, documentation that we're reviewing because the condominium laws are fairly strict as far as to what we can and can't do. And, and, and so is the law and the case history. Um, we review this to, um, this, isn't a, this isn't something new that's being developed, it's existing. And so we just give it a review, um, a zoning review and a regulation review and review the condo documents. Everything's already in place, so they want to change the form of ownership. We, the planning board can't discriminate against the form of ownership, given that nothing's changing on the site. That there's still two single-family dwellings, and that there will continue to be. Um, any further comments or questions from the public? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, can I could continue I, with the public? Or I'm I sorry. No, I'm not the public. I, well, unless I get demoted <laughs> tonight. No, we, we don't have any alternates. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, any further? Yeah, do you want to comment on the public comments? Yeah, you? just a comment on the density. We're talking about um, the lakefront lots here were originally several, this was actually several smaller lots that were combined. Uh, it's about three acres, and the back lots over an acre. So the density, you have four, it meets the zoning requirements for density. Um, it's about four acres of land the two dwellings. The dwellings have been there, they existed, which is changing the form of ownership. Um, it has almost 200 feet of lake frontage. So it's, most of the lots on Spindle Point, um, just coincidentally, I live at 93 Spindle Point Road and have for 20-something years. Um, my wife's family has been there much longer, but it, I'm familiar with a lot of the properties that are a lot smaller. A lot of them are only half an acre in size. Some may be closer to an acre, they all have 100 feet of frontage, some a little bit more, some lots that will combine might have 200 feet, but this is probably more closely conforming than a lot of the properties in the neighborhood, so I don't think it's contributing adversely as far as the density goes. And, and anyway, they're, they're limited to the number of bedrooms on site based on state regulations for sewage loading, um, and, and that's, this will have to meet that requirement as well. And there will be two separate independent septic systems, one for unit A and one for unit B. Yeah. Looks like we have someone else from the public. If you can uh, come up. I just have a question. I'd like to know how can, much. Can you come up? And, uh, it's just so that we can record it. Ann Coburn, 61, Spindle Point Road. I'm just wondering how much shorefront frontage there is. The, the lots on Spindle Point were originally measured out for a hundred feet. And you say there's several lots combined here and have acreage, but I'd just like to know what the shore frontage is because if it's one lot, one and a half lots, two lots on the on the lakeside. That's really the density that my neighbors are talking about. I think I, yeah, as I just stated a few minutes ago, it's about 200 feet. Okay. Um, any further questions from the public? Okay. Hearing none, I'll close the public portion of this meeting and move it back to the board for any further discussion, motions, or uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, actually, Dave has touched on, on some of what I was going to say. It's just a comment, uh, and I certainly appreciate your concern regarding the density of the population and the impact that it, that it might have on a, on a quiet cove, uh, but it is not within the realm of, of this board to limit the number of bedrooms, for example, of that, that any dwelling has as long as it 
meets DES's requirements for, for, for septic approval. Um, so you know, it's kind of something that we don't have uh, any authority over. But we can still sympathize with your concern. Yeah, I wanted to bring that up about the condominiums, that it's a, it's a fairly limited review, um, you know, assuming that there's nothing that's found out, you know, that's odd or whatever, that uh, um, some existing conditions that are illegal or something. But um, the, uh, the review is very limited to the formal ownership, and it's just basically not too much more than review of the condominium documents to make sure that... Uh, we have everything that's uh, required. So, I have to point that out because not everybody's always happy when we have condominiums uh, set up. It seems to always be a, a point of contention uh, when it happens because it, our normal process uh, for things are for site review and for things of that nature. This is sort of a special thing where we're just looking at the ownership form. Uh, Normally, we don't look at the ownership form, but for condominiums, we do because there are some certain special provisions that have to be um, handled with them. So, if uh, anyone from the board wants to question, I'm just this is just a question I'm, for my own. If this, if this was just a nothing was on this, no houses, nothing, and we were looking at it, would two homes be allowed on it? You can have a house and an accessory apartment per each lot. So we're looking at, the, at the, so these are the two separate lots. So okay. if you could subdivide, well, there are, there are two lots. Yes, there's two separate lots of record. Um, I guess I was looking at it as one whole piece, so thank you. There, there's two, there's right, there's two lots, one on each side of the road. However, if you wanted to have two lakefront houses, you'd have to have one being a house and then another one being an accessory apartment. But they're not two separate single-family dwellings by our zoning. If you wanted two single-family separate, two separate single-family dwellings at the lake like this, you'd probably have to subdivide this larger lot into two so there was two different. And um, I didn't review it. I didn't, you know, ask myself that question and take the zoning and do a review of a hypothetical, but I'd have to review the zoning to see if, if that would conform, which probably it doesn't. Most maybe they, I don't know. I would assume that it would, you could come up with something that might conform. If you, you mean if you made it too long, redid a lot longer and stuff like that? Further comments, or questions, or a motion? I think I, I think you need 150 feet of lake frontage just to create a lakefront lot. So if you needed 150 oh, feet, you know I think these were all done with 100. So I it's think it's not 100 in that area. No. No. Oh, okay. Just because they were done 100. Yeah, okay, Dave, go ahead. To answer the question if the property could be subdivided, no, because there's insufficient frontage. They need 150 feet per lot under current requirements. At the time it was subdivided, most of the lots were 100 foot in length. So, but as far as uh, what could be done, it could be a single family home with 14 bedrooms if you incorporate the land in the back as floating area, or oh, oh, greater than that. Will they share a dock? I don't understand how the water spots can be with all the houses and people. What happens with the water spots? I'll could, could, uh, tell you what, could you come up for the question? Okay. <laughs> I'm Susan Emery. I'm 
life to draw that memory. And I've been coming here since, I hate to admit it, but 1951. And I stayed in the house right next to where this is all going on. Um, but I'm just wondering about the waterfront. I kayak and I go by that almost every day. And I'm just wondering how the dock and the waterfront's going to work. Because that's a lot of people in a short, in a little bit of uh, space in the, on the water. Uh, to respond? Sure. Um, right now there's the boathouse, which half of it's usable as a boathouse. This is happening one slip in the boathouse. And then there's two permanent docks. The limited common area hits the shore. The division between limited common area A and limited common area B comes to the shore between the two docks, so they'll each have their own dock. There's no additional docks being proposed, or I don't think any additional docks would be allowed under current regulations. Okay, but uh, any further questions from the public? Okay. I'm sorry. Yes. My name is Chairman uh, Patrick Wood, representing Spindle Cove Civic Association, and I just uh, I'm not sure if you got a copy of my letter that I sent to the uh, planner yesterday, um, giving you a little bit of a background. Uh, and these questions that have been asked this evening with uh, the questions that we were struggling with over the last few weeks and dealing with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Seeley and uh, their representatives. Uh, these properties were originally two lots on the waterfront, and then the third a set of lots were the back lots. And in about 1980, this new house, which is shown as Unit A, was built, was given approval, uh, and was constructed on the site. The original dwelling, Unit B, has been there for many years. Um, so when we looked at the proposal, we realized that there were two dwellings already on the site. So we negotiated uh, with the uh, applicant and they with us uh, to tie it into the covenants and restrictions which say you can have one dwelling per lot and one guest house. There were originally two lots, as I said, on the waterfront. Now there was a dwelling on one lot, which was Unit B, and then a new dwelling, Unit A, now, on the smaller lot. So when we were given the uh, documents to review, there already were two dwellings there. We worked with them to put the restrictions in that you heard tonight in the memorandum that relate to the future use of the property to keep it as close as possible to the covenants and restrictions that exist. So that's sort of the background where we came from and how we came up with the, uh, the agreement that we did come up with. Just, just a comment, yeah. I, mean, I guess that's kind of why you have associations and all, but again, that's not really a part of our correct preview because uh, that is a civil matter between um, the association and uh, landowners. <coughs> Thank you. I was just giving it as a yeah. Back. No, I understand. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that because it does give context to what we're on that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do, do we have any other comments? Any new concerns or issues anyone might have? As if not, I'll close the public portion of the hearing and bring it back to the board for any additional comments or a motion. In the case of the uh, applicant, Richard Seeley, proposed subdivision and site plan application for a condominium. Assessors map U23, lot 15 and 36, located at 12 Oak Island Road, the Lake Winnipesaukee Watershed, the Shoreline District.
motion is that we approve the site plan amendment for the purpose of converting two single family dwellings and accessory structures into a condominium form of ownership on the condition that approval will be, uh, be received from DES for the septic system for Unit A, CA 87810, that that approval be noted on the plan. Thank you. The condition being that the two bedrooms associated with the bunkhouse and the boathouse, I'm sorry, that the, the guest house and boathouse uh, be a accounted for in the septic design for unit B. The DES construction approval numbers for the subsurface disposal systems shall be noted on the final plan. And uh, I think we should make some some reference to the memorandum of agreement. Okay, it's incorporated into the declarations. Okay, thank you. Uh, then the final condition being that this is a conditional subdivision approval. It is valid for a period of 24 months, at which time final approval must be obtained or a public hearing must be held for the planning board to grant additional time. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, I motion and a second. Um, Mary Lee, will you hold the board, please? Mrs. Lovell? Yes. Mr. Savell? Yes. Mr. Butler? Yes. Mr. Gergen? Yes. Mr. Feathers? Yes. Mr. Tui? Yes. And Mr. Lyon? Yes. Okay. Um, we're gonna, so it is approved. Uh, yes, if you would. Did you have a question? Yeah. Did you approve the site plan? Both. Both. I'm going to take a five minute break. Uh, if you don't come back in five minutes, uh, Mr. Sura will take it. Okay. Boundary line adjustment not resulting in any nonconformities. 
as with every boundary line adjustment, we will certify that the pins have been set prior to recording the mylar, and also there will be some demonstration by the attorney who prepares the deed that there's no mortgage existing on the Hubbard Beach Association property. If there were a mortgage, they would have to provide evidence of a mortgage release for this very small piece of property. Any questions? I'll be happy to try to answer them. Okay, any questions from the board? Uh, hearing none, Angela, do you have any comments on that? Do we have any maps or anything like that? Uh, there's a small one. Sorry. Um, it doesn't really tell you what's being, other than kind of visualizing, it doesn't really tell you what's being. Here come the maps. And the only reason this plan is as big as it is is because I already had it. Prepare, prepare for something else. Uh, we printed a lot of paper for this, but it does show the entirety of the Harvard Beach Association property. Yeah. Okay. Any questions from the board? Any comments from the board? Any questions from the board? Any comments from the board? So at, at the top there, you'll see a little parcel name, labeled Parcel A. Parcel in, in yellow here. Parcel A, yeah. So the, the, existing, the existing line is getting shifted to the south. Is that south? Correct. It's getting shifted south. And this labeled line to be discontinued. And then there's a solid black line, and right above it it says paved drive. That's the area of encroachment. So that, I guess it's a triangular piece. to be conveyed to the single family dwelling to the north of the Hover Beach Association Lock. That, that single family dwelling, I believe that lot is less than 40,000 square feet. Existing 26,541. <laughs> and with the math, look at that. It's becoming larger, so it's becoming more conforming. It'd be 27,406. And the line is no closer to the single family dwelling. To, the proposed line is no closer to the single family dwelling. So there will not be a non-conformity created or compounded. If anything, it's becoming more conforming. You just answered my two questions. And one thing I did notice on the plan that I will correct prior to recording of the Mylar is that the setback that's shown here is from the original line, and I will amend that setback on the Harvard Beach property to reflect the setback when the boundary line adjustment is actually uh, taking place. It'll just move it 20 feet parallel to the new line. And I did meet with both members of the Hubbard Beast Association and Mrs. Heffern. There were several different uh, suggestions made and options rev reviewed, and this is the option that they ultimately came to an agreement. So with a boundary line adjustment, I typically just make sure nothing is becoming non-conforming or more non-conforming, which it isn't. And I always check to make sure that whatever piece of land that's being conveyed or acquired, um, that it always states that that, in this case it's labeled parcel A, that it states it's going to be merged with lot 25A, so that no one's confused that that's a standalone new lot. And, and Typically what happens in these cases is the deed is actually executed and delivered to the town and the deed and the plan are recorded simultaneously to prevent that from happening. Right. So, pretty straightforward. Okay. Any questions or comments from the board? Uh, hearing none, I'll open it to the public. Anyone from the public care to speak? Uh, hearing none, I guess I'll close the public portion of the hearing. And we'll be back to the board for further comment or a motion. Mr. Chairman, yes. I'd like to make a motion. Okay. In the matter of Mayor 
Mary Heffron and Harbor Beach Association, a proposed boundary line adjustment. Uh, assessors reference uh, maps U29, lot 30, and U28, lot 29A. And <clears throat> on Stony Island Road, Lake Wampi, Wind, Lake Winnipesaukee Watershed, and the Shoreline District. Um, that the boundary line adjustment uh, be approved. Um, subject to the fact that the applicant shall, uh, as is indicated, prepare a draft conveyance deed for the staff to review and the executed deed shall be recorded with the bylaw. Uh, the applicant shall verify in writing whether there exists a mortgage on lot 30, which is the association land, and if there is, there shall be a satisfactory lease recorded in conjunction with the conveyance deed. And that the uh, PINs uh, survey of records shall provide written evidence that all PINs have been set prior to the recording of the bylaw. Okay, we have a motion to have a second. Second. A motion and a second. Any questions or anything on the motion? Hearing none, Mary Lee, will you poll the board, please? Second. Yes. Mrs. Lapham? Yes. Mrs. Butler? Yes. Mr. Tilly? Yes. Mr. Savell? Yes. Mr. Durkin? Yes. And Mr. Lyons? Yes. Next we have Dean Hall, Mr. Chair. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. S19 lot 4 located at 55 Daniel Webster Highway in the commercial south route, commercial room 3 south district. Thank you. Dan Ellis with Ames Associates representing the applicant, Mr. Alquist. Um, property is the 1.2 acre site in the Commercial Route 3 South District. Um, I'm sure most of you remember it from approximately a year ago, I think it was, that we were here. Well, I guess it was more than that. Time flies. Uh, May 2012 maybe was the last time we were here. Um, the existing approved plan included um, there's two large garages on the property each with three large um, bays in them uh, the existing approved plan included uh, the potential for si all six of those bays to be rented out for businesses of the type um, auto boat and equipment sales service and repair uh, that was the category that was approved um, and they also fell under the category of wholesale businesses with no outside storage. Um, also, part of that approved plan was an office space above the uh, building number one, on the second floor of building number one, and a residential apartment. Um, the proposed amendment, although we're proposing an, an entirely different use, or an added use for the property, and that use does require um, more parking than any of the rental base had required individually. Still, in my mind, it actually represents um, a somewhat less intense use of the property. In that, uh, what's happening is we're actually going to go from six total rental bays all the way down to two. Um, two of the other rental bays um, will be now used as storage only. 
um, and then the other two of the six will be used for the proposed uh, new use martial arts classes. Um, the martial arts classes are something that the owner of the property is already involved in and uh, they take place in Laconia right now and his desire is to move them to this building. Um, so he's already familiar with uh, the class size and so forth that, uh, that has already been occurring and, and, and knows what the needs are there. Um, so what we've planned here for is um, the front portion of building number one, these two front bays of that building would be used for the martial arts classes um, of a class size of 10 students and one instructor. Um, so we need uh, 11 parking spaces total for that use. Um, due to the elimination of two-thirds of the rental bays, our parking requirement total actually stays the same and there's no changes proposed to the site. Um, as, as part of this proposed amendment. Um, one of the first things that uh, we discussed when the applicant um, came to uh, Ames Associates for this proposed amended plan, we just discussed, uh, you know, we're already at the, uh, the maximum parking that we have on the, on the site for this new proposed use and rearrangement of uses. Uh, we've got 28 spaces total. We're going to use every one of those. Is this really going to work if these classes grow at all? You know, or are we shoehorning this in? So we did look at some possibilities for future expansion just to be sure that this was really appropriate for the site. Um, I actually have with me um, a couple of concept plans of how the parking might be expanded. I'm only providing those for informational purposes just to let the board know that we've thought about these things. This isn't anything that we're asking you to approve. This, we know that if uh, expansion of parking were to become a necessity in the future, we'd be back before the board uh, for another amendment. Um, the analysis that we did on uh, the potential for additional parking um, focused on uh, do we have room within the setbacks to accomplish more parking spaces and also can we do it without going over the maximum lot coverage allowed in this zone, which is 65%. As you can see, the existing condition of the site is we're at 64. Um, so um, let me hand these out and then I can explain what they mean. spaces we can gain. We can gain uh, nine spaces if we stick with the site plan review regulation uh, size for a standard parking stall, which is 10 feet by 20 feet. Um, that parking stall size is, is pretty ample for uh, vehicles of all sizes. Um, there are certainly parking spaces striped at various uh, commercial developments that are a little bit smaller, 9 by 18. So the concept number two would be that we'd be able to get 12 spaces if in the future we needed them and the board would entertain a waiver to the uh, that parking stall size requirement. Um, the way that we're accomplishing the additional spaces in this concept and still staying under the lot coverage is pretty simple. Um, the a large portion of the east end of the property is all gravel uh, behind building number two. Um, everything outside of the limits of the parking that's shown in red on those concepts could be um, uh, revegetated uh, to become green space and that would keep us under that 65% maximum coverage. So again, these, 
those two concepts are just for informational purposes only, just to show you that the site works right now for what we're proposing, and also we've thought about uh, potential for future needs. Should there become a parking problem um, if these class sizes grow at all? Um, the other thing about parking is that these classes could happen potentially at different times uh, during the day um, or evening. Um, if a class were to happen um, in the evening after hours for the other businesses on site, then obviously that parking would be freed up and able to be used for the martial arts classes. So all in all, I think we have plenty of parking existing right now. And again, if it were to become a problem because of future growth, we have that potential. Um, the use that we're proposing, martial arts classes, is permitted in this zone. Um, and again, the other uses are staying the same. Um, there's no, no other new uses proposed. Um, it's just that we're reducing the number of potential rental bays. Um, I believe that covers uh, the proposal, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Is this the sort of um, business that's going to have competitions and exhibitions, or is it strictly a classroom space? It is strictly a classroom space. So it's there won't ever be any other teams competing or other individuals competing with the students from the school or exhibitions of accomplishments? I don't believe the site would accommodate that kind of further parking, and I'm sure that's why you're asking the question. Mm -hmm. So no, this is a this is for martial arts classes only. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? And Joy, do you have anything to add? Um, sure. Dan did a good job of pretty much hitting all the points that are that are in the staff report. Um, this is. This is basic. This is a change of use application, um, going from what could have been um, automotive and boat repair and sales to this um, martial arts class. I think it's important to note that um, Mr. Alquist, that owns the property, and these are his businesses that are on the property. So. Um, I guess it's in, it's in his own interest, uh, definitely, to make sure that, that it all works out. Um, you know, the Acme Choppers is his business, I believe, you know, like a relative owns the apartment. The martial arts is, his, is also his business. And so um, I think, I think uh, definitely a lot of thought went into whether or not it's going to work. Certainly, it would be in his own interest that it works well because, um, like I said, they are his businesses and he isn't currently um, renting out any of the spaces. I did note in the staff report that you probably noticed um, a condition, a potential condition that talks about, you know, if the class grows larger, um, you know, it may, it may require additional review by the planning board. Um, there's an awful lot of, the, this, this lot is nearly maxed out in coverage, but as Dan said, there is an, an awful lot of gravel area here that could be easily restored um, or a portion of it converted to, to parking. So um, I think if that if the need came up as Dan demonstrated in these two concept plans, there certainly is a, a possibility to accommodate that additional parking um, should the class size grow. I'm not sure if you mentioned it or not. What hours would there would the classes be? I mean, typically these sort of things don't really happen midday because kids are in school. So I'm envisioning it probably would have hours of operation that would almost be opposite that of the um, motorcycle business. Yeah, I think that would be typical um, right now that they would be in the evening, like you said. Most uh, and this these are. Um, actually classes for adults is my understanding um, and most of them are available in the evening 
all went anyway. But we did not discuss limiting the time at all. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, can they meet and does the parking work? Questions for the board? Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Will the name go on the existing sign? I honestly don't know the answer to that question, whether or not this uh, class of use even has a, an official name or whether this is just a, a more of a private invitation only type of, um, of class. Um, if there is a um, sign, then yes, it would go on the existing uh, sign, uh, uh, the, the type of sign is escaping me, pylon sign. Freestanding. Uh, yeah, freestanding sign on the property and would be subject to uh, code enforcement review and, and the sign ordinance. So the sign ordinance permits that there's one, one freestanding sign, you, you can only have one freestanding sign unless you go for a variance to have more than one, and so um, they would either have to put something below that sign, which when I when this first came to us, um, the proposed sign did show several kind of spaces for tenants, though because there's just one, there's only been one put on, but certainly there's room underneath to put them. And then also the ordinance does provide um, 32 square feet for each business on the building. And they would need a sign permit. They would be reviewed. Hi. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Just a, a question. Um, when the motion may be made, uh, we would obviously make the note uh, in terms of the, the class and the parking. But my question is, is there is there any value or should we perhaps uh, in that motion allude to the possibility for expansion? Do we, do we want to incorporate that? I mean, even though this is strictly for our edification, because I, I agree, you don't want to get a business started and then say, I'm sorry, you can't expand it any further. That doesn't seem to make any sense. Is that something you want to uh, allude to? Or is that not common? If, if you do reference those, I would just be clear that those aren't, you're not pre approving those plans. Well, that was the reason I was asking. I, I, I mean, I just want to be careful how it was done, but it seemed to me that, that you know, I mean, if somebody was looking at these minutes, they would they'd say, oh my gosh, I mean, you, you've got to address some potential expansion. Uh, of activities if, if the business grows because it's at the max right now. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't know whether it was whether there was value to that uh, or not. I, I think in the past we have indicated um, you know potential areas for expansion of parking um, and some other things because we have occasionally had so like for instance, the same were just options were just discussed. Yeah, we would put that, we, you know, this one's a little more conceptual than some of the others. Some may designate an area that, you know, if this does expand, we're going to build here. This one is, I you could designate, more, so a little more. You could designate potential additional parking in the, in the back, in that gravel area. We could have a label for a limited expansion um, in an area that's already locked coverage. But I think, but I think if you were to start greening up some space and then putting lot coverage on other space, that would probably warrant additional review. Yeah. The, the only reason I was mentioning, I mean, to me, it would seem that if we didn't ask the questions and they hadn't explored it, that we would be setting a business. We go and set. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, you know, up for what what I call a, a, a potential conflict. And so I just, I was just for my own clarification. So possibly this site, as an idea of the site plan, could potentially be amended to show a few additional parking spaces in the gravel for a minimum, a, a minimum, of, you know, additional parking spaces, and then should something drastic be needed, then you'd have to come in front of the board again. Because that's a that's a lot of gravel. Yeah, I think if I'm following the line of reasoning, I mean, uh, just to reiterate, the only purpose of those plans is is just for informational purposes to say, hey, we thought about this. Um, I'm certainly not looking for any kind of pre-approval for 
even parking rearrangement. I mean, we, we do think that there's more than adequate parking right now. Um, simply wanted the board to be aware that there's potential there if parking were to become a problem. Um, and I, you know, we'd be more than happy to come back in before the board with a, with a full, fully developed um, uh, site plan amendment plan um, to show that additional parking when it becomes necessary. Uh, I personally don't feel that there's a need to formally address it right now. If I if I'm answering the question. Yeah, no, that's fine. So. Could I just get a little clarification of the existing businesses within this existing building? Um, I know there's the, uh, you know, the upstairs, but on the downstairs you say there's, you know, or I should say existing. What you're proposing? You're proposing two bays for martial arts. Correct. Two bays for storage. I assume that's associated with the Acme Chopper business, or is it, or is it different storage? Um, there's three bays in each building. So two bays in this building number one will be the martial arts. That's, those are the two oh, bays okay. closest to Route 3. The third bay would be for storage only. Oh, okay. um, now that storage can, can be associated with any use on the site, um, is what we're planning. And kind of the reason, this is, this is a bit of a unique situation. You know, Mr. Aquist lives right next door. Um, well, he originally, we came in here and, and he was building these buildings, he wanted to maximize his potential for income from this property. That was the reason for the six rental bays. None of that has really come to fruition. He's, it's basically him that's using the property. Acme Choppers currently occupies two bays in building number two. That is his business. And the third bay is, again, used for storage only. Okay. Um, the office is actually another, is occupied by another business of his. And then, as was already mentioned, the residential apartment right now is occupied by a relative. Um, so it is a unique situation. Okay, but uh, yeah, I was getting a little confused with where the bays were. Like I say, maybe I thought there were six on this one building. Um, so, yeah, it makes a lot more sense what you explained. So that yes. whole building then, in effect, is going to be a martial arts building? No. Uh, no, there's. Building number one has two floors. No, yeah, I know. I'm not counting the second floor. I meant on the first floor. Yep, two thirds of it will be martial arts. The remaining <coughs> third is so storage. So that's not where the Acme Chopper is going to. Correct. Yeah, They're in know, building know, number two. Yep. Thing in so that's gone. What's gone? Well, the when, potential. I drive, when I drive by, I mean, you do see there's a window, there's something there that shows, looks like a, like a motorcycle thing is going on in there. It, there's a window for display area yeah. in this building. Yeah, yeah. that's going to that's gonna become the martial arts use. Yeah. 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 Any further questions? <clears throat> okay, I am going to open it up to the public. Um, we do have somebody here, so uh, do you have any questions? Or? No, I don't. No. Okay, so I'll close the portion, public portion of the hearing, bring it back for uh, either further discussion or a motion. Mr. Chairman, yes. I'll uh, make a motion as a matter of Wayne A. Alfred Jr. for a site plan amendment for Marshall's arts class, change of use application, accessors reference map, S19 lot 4, located at 55 Daniel Webster Highway, in the Neil Brook Merritt Bay watershed, and commercial route 3 south. Uh, in the matter of the proposed site plan amendment, they're looking at building 1.1 to establish a martial arts instruction space of about 2,700 feet in the front two-thirds of that building and the balance for storage. That would be conditional upon putting a note uh, that 11 spaces are, are required and that, um, uh, that the note would be added to the plan that states the martial arts class is limited to a maximum of 10 students during business hours so it's not to conflict with existing parking demand. And then add that there was some general discussion in regards to some additional uh, creation of parking space uh, should the need arise. Um, and then, of course, subject to planning board, reserving the right to review and 
amend the approval as provided for the site plan regulation 6 and 17. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any questions about the motion? Hearing none, Mary Lee, will you pull forward, please? Mr. Clapham? Yes. Mr. Clapham? Yes. Mr. Gergen? Yes. Mr. Tui? Yes. Mr. Bowles? Yes. Mr. Sorrell? Yes. And Mr. Byer? Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, why don't we clean this up a little bit and then we have a presentation, I believe, by one of our esteemed board members.
program year 2015, the recommended municipal capital improvement program includes additional capital project spending in the amount of $380,000. And I will elaborate on where that money is proposed to be going. For 2015, the Capital Improvement Program Advisory Committee recommends a municipal capital improvement program that is debt repayment plus capital projects of $1,368,677. This represents a decrease of 13.55% compared to the 2014 municipal capital improvement related appropriations. The municipal debt service schedule indicates that additional debt will be required in 2016 through, will be retired in 2016 through 2022. The committee understands that as debt is retired, program capacity associated with the retired debt will be available to support future capital needs. The town manager has advised that in addition to what has been identified and programmed, there are significant capital projects that are likely to come before the committee in the future. These include replacement of municipal utilities located in US 3 and New Hampshire Route 25, repair or replacement of waterfront infrastructure, the replacement of the DPW garage and related site improvements, and sewer and water infrastructure replacements. The committee has not programmed these potential projects at this time. It is anticipated, however, that these projects, that when these projects become more defined, requests will be submitted for consideration in future CIP amendment cycles. Meredith is one of three communities that comprise the Lakes Region Interlake School District. Meredith taxpayers are responsible for approximately 75% of the district's costs, including capital projects. The district has developed a six-year capital improvements program. The district program includes four projects that when prorated to reflect Meredith's share of the district costs meet the Meredith CIP threshold of $90,000. Meredith prorated share is reflected in the Meredith Capital Improvements Program. And I'm noting it tonight for informational purposes only because it's not a part of this CIP report or recommendation. So just to, just to summarize real quickly, I'll go back to that first paragraph. The kind of expense that we, we inherit as a CIP is existing debt service, and that is $990,000, uh, $864. This is principal paid on debt, and it's also interest paid on debt. What we work with then is uh, Another $380,000, that's what we came up with, that we would put with that this year as a recommendation. Looking ahead to the projects that we see uh, are most urgent. And that, that amount of $380,000 is somewhat less than what we asked for a year ago. Okay, specifically, and this I'll go through quite briefly, um, the following departments uh, reported to us and informed us of their needs and or in some instances that they did not have a need to present this year that came up to our threshold of $90,000. The fire department, we are recommending that the fire department be allocated $75,000 in 2015 through 2017 for the uh, Vehicle Replacement Expendable Trust Fund. Specifically, this will complete the amount of money in that trust fund 
for us to purchase a rescue vehicle. The allocations for 2016 and 17 that we're recommending for a future year will be for the replacement of firefighter turnout gear in 2017 in the amount of $135,000 and capital equipment replacement needs uh, in, in, the, in the future, which may result in uh, a replacement for uh, tanker number five. So we are requesting $75,000 to go into the already existing expendable trust fund for the fire department. The Department of Public Works, we are recommending that $305,000 be appropriated to the expendable trust fund and $275,000 in 2016 and 2017. This is for the replacement of equipment. The 2015 allocation is in anticipation of the near-term purchase of a replacement loader and the replacement of the Ford 550. Allocations in 2016 and 17 are in, in, are in anticipation of capital equipment replacement needs beyond the near-term, such as dump trucks, truck a tub grinder and back row hold that will require additional future allocations. As far as the DPW facility is concerned, there is no additional funding being recommended by the Capital Improvement Committee at this time. Uh, the rationale being that in 2014 the town appropriated $100,000 to conduct a feasibility study, and this study is just getting underway. Uh, we expect that uh, this uh, uh, facility will be requesting funds in, 2000, uh, in 2015. Moving on, uh, waterfront inf infrastructure. Uh, no additional funding is recommended at this time. Uh, you are well aware that uh, there's going to be a potential for work at the intersection of Route 3 and Route 25 and uh, that that will impact the, the waterfront area there uh, and uh, we have a study uh, under, underway that we'll be looking into those future needs at that time. Uh, general government, there is no, no uh, expected uh, request for funds. Funds there, uh, Brenda Bittner has advised that uh, we have the best interest rates that could possibly be achieved at this point, so there'd be no refinancing of the debt. Uh, our interest rates are all under four uh, percent, and uh, so that I can skip over the rest there. Water and sewer department improvements. There is uh, no request there. Uh, the uh, water department is currently developing an asset management plan for the water infrastructure. Uh, so that we can anticipate uh, that report and perhaps uh, uh, be adding to the expendable trust fund at that time. Currently, the expendable trust fund for the water system improvement has $232,881. Groundwater study source, there's no uh, additional funding being recommended at this time. Uh, this, this involves uh, our I desire to have a redundancy in water supply in case something is <coughs> what you want. Uh, well testing has been done at Prescott Park and continues to be done. We're working with uh, uh, the Department of Environmental Services and uh, uh, the uh, money that has been set aside for that study will be depleted uh, and uh, the remaining money is only about $9,000 in that expendable trust. Sewer system improvements, there's no recommendation at this time for that. There is currently $496,078 in that expendable trust fund. Uh, the public library has made no, uh, no formal request at this time. Uh, you, will, uh, you will recall that in 2014, $177,859 was appropriated. Uh, for the purpose of exterior renovations to the library. Uh, 
some of that work is ongoing. Uh, the remainder of it is expected to be completed in 2015. Uh, we do anticipate that there will be some issues regarding air conditioning and heating uh, in the next few years uh, as there is a, uh, already a, a, a problem with coolant that is no longer approved, coolant that's required for the system that is no longer approved by the federal government for use. Open space conservation, uh, you probably recall that when the Page Pond project was approved and the town appropriated some $400,000 for a bond to acquire that property, uh, the Conservation uh, and Open Space and Conservation Commission uh, promised that they would not make any request of the uh, CIP until the uh, bond was completely paid off. The Open Space Conservation Expendable Trust Fund uh, estimated balance at the end of uh, this year is $39,000, so they're getting to their goal. And finally, as far as the Ander Lake school system is concerned, uh, and this does not have to do, uh, again, with this CIP report, but is merely to report to you what they are doing within their budget uh, that will impact us to the, to the extent that 75%, roughly 75% of the cost of the Interlake School Systems District projects uh, fall as a burden onto the town of Maryland. Uh, their recommendation is to allocate uh, some $311,000 plus or minus in 2015, 97000 in 2016, uh, 228,000, 2017, 58,250, and 2018. The projects that they're looking at are the end of Lakes uh, roof, uh, energy upgrades in both buildings, replacement of auditorium seating, and the replacement of the turf field. Again, this is all going to come out of their budget uh, and is only for informational purposes at this time. School District Facilities Maintenance Expendable Trust Fund estimate balance at the end of this year uh, is expected to be $359,954. In summary, uh, and you can see this on, on the page if you follow along, you can see that in 2014 the capital appropriation recommendation uh, was for $1,583,261. And this year that appropriation request is for $1,364,677. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, there is available uh, a list, uh, a, a graph, a data, data sheet uh, that I have here of the trust funds, all of the trust funds, what's held in those trust funds. There's also uh, data here that spells out the projected expenses uh, into the future that we anticipate. And finally, uh, there is the, uh, uh, the, the debt release, the debt forgiveness sheet as prorated out through 2024 at this point in time. This is my uh, the committee report from the advisory committee on the Capital Improvement Committee, and we recommend that uh, you, uh, as the Planning Board, we recommend that the Planning Board make a motion uh, to accept these recommendations and forward them to the Board of Selection. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, and I want to thank uh, all the people who worked on the Capital Improvements Program Advisory Committee, uh, it's an interesting committee. We have a couple of former chairmen uh, and a chairman here on the planning board. So, um, it's, we are familiar with the process, a number of us are, and uh, um, I've been very pleased with the results. Uh, does anybody have any comments or questions or anything about this? Okay. I
I just wanted to pass along my one little comment to you. I always have to put something in, uh, to the planning board representative. Uh, we got a lot coming up, and we did decrease it for now. One of the things we have been trying to do is keep things somewhat level funded, so kind of ask that you don't further cut it, as, as occasionally has happened when the budget gets really, really tight. But uh, I think you've learned, you know, we've been through that and have learned a few lessons with it. So. The, 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 Mr. Chair, I had a comment that um, Phil Warren did certainly emphasize that there's a lot that's coming. And this was not a year where we had a lot of, of debt paid off. This was a, a low year in terms of that. Uh, and there will be further debt that will go off the, off the, uh, the sheet in the next couple of years. To our advantage, obviously, because this thing's coming down the pike. Uh, but as uh, the, as you realize, and as uh, I, I should say, that there is that ninety thousand uh, dollar limit or a minimum for any kind of a capital improvement project. So these things that we deal with are not uh, operational. Right, mm -hmm. operational things. They are really so. That there will be those years. With, we just may not have uh, proposals before us that we feel comfortable recommending that money be set aside in expendable trust fund for. And uh, in other years, that amount is going to be greater. No two ways about that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Again, I'd like to say uh, my thanks go off to the, to the committee um, in terms of the endeavors and some of the difficulties that, that, that we're all faced with. I think last year uh, uh, we made a serious effort uh, at the selectman level to, um, to incorporate um, uh, some of our, uh, what I call rainy day or surplus funds uh, as, as a commitment and a way of supporting the capital improvements after somewhat of a hiatus for the last couple of years. Um, I think the, um, uh, the big thing that you should look at this year is the debt service um, actually rose slightly in this last year because of some of the efforts at taking advantage of the refinancing and debt. Um, so uh, we, uh, we saved some money, but the uh, big thing is <clears throat> we saved some money in the future. We had, I think, two or three um, uh, parcels of debt that the town refinanced, and we shortened the term even though we lowered the rates, so we had a slight spike over the next couple of years in total debt service, uh, recognizing that um, that we might have to take from surplus funds to help support that. So, uh, but basically, uh, from 2016 to 2018, um, there is some capacity that's being built into, um, uh, shall we say, the capital improvements program in anticipation of both <coughs> significant projects uh, and. Um, and being able to, shall we say, use some of that uh, that, uh, that that surplus um, uh, funding that we have in our million eight uh, uh, approximate commitment. So uh, it's uh, I think it's it's good. It's all part of the planning process, and um, and uh, it sets us up in a good place both for what I would call probably public works future uh, project coming forward, and 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 the, the infrastructure that more than likely. Will be Do I have a uh, motion to uh, accept this and forward this recommendation? This is one thing we do. We do uh, uh, have a motion on their uh, recommendations. And, uh, yeah. Do I have a motion to approve the recommendations of the committee uh, to forward to the select? So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. A motion on a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, anything additional, Angela, or are we ready to adjourn? I have something very quickly. So after the holidays are all over, um, beginning in 2015, I hate saying that, beginning in 2015, I'd like to um, schedule 
a workshop every month in addition to our regular meetings so I can um, kick up the um, master plan and finish that off. Um, we have pretty much everything done with consultant that we wanted to do in the way of GIS. And I know I updated you guys on, on where we were at um, a little while ago and so I want to just move forward and, and in an effort to keep the ball rolling, I was hoping that the board would commit to a workshop in addition to our regular meeting um, so that we could finish it up before summer comes so we can focus on zoning amendments. <laughs> oh, um, I think the thought is to do it uh, on the second Tuesday. Is that ambitious or is that okay? Uh, the the thought is to do it on the second Tuesday, um, in addition to the we used yeah, I think to. Have we shift around a little bit? But. Yeah, we can shift. We used to actually. Uh, Roger probably remembers that. <laughs> we used to meet twice a month, and we used to have some. That wasn't that long ago. I am. And uh, we used to have some pretty long meetings when things were really humming. So. Uh, um, just, I think we can discuss the particulars. Angela, could you just make up a calendar and send us some I will, I will. Because some of us have other commitments. And yeah, let proposals you know. so we can. Yeah, and, and you know, they're workshops. And so, you know, if we get a whole board, if we get a majority of the board, right. I think I could update whomever wasn't present. We're going to be all here, but you'll be here. Yes. Yeah, we'll they would be held at the workshops would be held at the annex. I think we we'll, we work better all around a table versus sitting like this. Yeah, it's like a it's on Wednesdays we go to the Quaggle <coughs> winding down with. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not available on Wednesdays. We could, that would get the juices we could, flowing. We could, we could the grape just, juice. No. Okay, motion to adjourn. Okay, all in favor, aye, aye. Okay, thank you. Well, Monday, Monday.